join in the responsive call to worship printed in the bulletin. We gather to worship God who does wondrous things, God of justice and love, be present to us in our worship. Renew us here as the showers that water the earth. God welcomes all people to this holy place. Blessed be God's glorious name. Please, jo Please join us in the lighting of the Advent candle, reading responsively from your bulletin. We will end by singing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Darkness can overcome. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shall be upon you. Hear now the words of the prophet Malachi. See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant who, whom you desire will come, says the Lord. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Today we light the second candle of Advent and remember God's messenger, John the Baptist, and how he calls each of us to prepare our hearts and lives for Christ's coming.
section is to be read responsibly. The Spirit of God be upon you, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, and the Spirit of knowledge. Almighty God, strong in your wisdom and might in your mercy, in this hour of worship, focus us on your great spirit of understanding. Grant us understanding in our relationships with one another, stranger or friend. Grant us a vision of a world where lion and lamb are together. Grant us a vision of a world where love is stronger than hate. Forgive us for being so blind to your peace, your strength, your love for us. Through Jesus Christ we pray. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. May the God of mercy who forgives you all your sins strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Each year, Betty Ann Dorman and Pat Wilson work with our fourth and fifth grade children for them to learn the children's catechism. If you haven't had a child go through that recently, you don't realize what effort goes into that. But it takes a whole lot of work by the teachers, by the families, and by the children themselves. So at this time, I would like to recognize two of our children who have completed this experience and learned the children's catechism. And I would like them to come forward um, with me here. Matthew Duncan Gwynn, son of Cynthia and Ken Gwynn. And Jonathan Richard Burke, son of Nell and Richard Burke. We are proud of you and all the hard work that you went to to accomplish this, and we also want to thank your parents. Matthew and Jonathan, congratulations.
I tried to keep Jonathan's money and cut you out of your song. So let's see if I can get through here without falling on my face. Can you have up just a minute? Okay. I did it. <laughs> That's good. You did a beautiful job. Thank you for sharing your gifts with us during this special season in the church year. I'd like to also invite any other children who did not sing this morning to come up and join us. You can sit on the steps or around me, um, wherever you want to be. Anyone else? This is a special season in the church year, isn't it? Does anyone know what that season is called? Advent, Advent great. Does anybody know what Advent means? Okay, Bailey. Okay, it means coming, it means Christ coming. And we think about Christ coming as a baby and we think about Christ coming into our lives and into our hearts. So it's a special season in which we prepare for Christ coming. Now I want you to look around the sanctuary and see if you can find some ways that we are preparing for Christ coming. Krista. Christmas trees. And we have a special name for Christmas trees that we put in the church at Christmas. Does anybody know what that is? Frasier. Yeah, we did, we did have a Frasier in here. You are exactly right. <laughs> Okay, but, but these look pretty tall and straight to me, so I think that these may not be a Frasier this year, but we call them Christmon trees, and we call them that because they have special ornaments on them, ornaments that were made lovingly by people in our church, and they all have something to do with Jesus Christ, either an emblem or a monogram or something that has to do with Jesus Christ. Now, what color do we have on our Christmas tree? What colors? White. White. And what else? There's another color. Gold. gold. That's right. White for the purity of Christ <coughs> and gold for royalty. And does anybody know why we have green Christmas trees? You ever thought about it? 
I've got a red one at home with wolf pack ornaments on it, but we always have green Christmas trees in the sanctuary because they're evergreen and they stay green all year, reminding us that God's love never dies. And we also have something else special in our sanctuary. Yes? Advent candles and an advent wreath. What's the shape of the advent wreath? Yes. It's a circle, that's right. And that's because God's love never ends. It just keeps going round and round like a circle. Now we have candles on our Advent wreath. Anybody know why we have candles? Anybody want to guess? Okay. Exactly right. And candles represent the light of Christ, and they help us during this Advent season to prepare for Christ's coming. And we light the candles, and sometimes we give names to those candles. Lots of times you hear the words hope, peace, love, and joy. And then the middle candle is what color? Right. And does anybody know what that candle is? The Christ candle. That's exactly right. And we light that one on Christmas Eve. Okay, let me see if I see anything different in here. Anybody else? Yes. What? Wreaths, that's right, to decorate. And again, we have green and we have circles. There are candles in the windows. What do you think is the special color for Advent? Yes. White is for Christmas, and we have lots of white in here, but there's another color that goes along with the white. Yes. Red, we have lots of red in here, and it is very much a Christmas color, but there's another, one more color. Okay. Purple, exactly right. And that's the color that we use for the pyramids and the candles and the stoles. And you see the pastors change their stoles on different times. And purple, again, is for the royalty of Christ. And then as we move towards Christmas, we have a pink candle and then a white candle. So there are lots of colors for the Advent Christmas season. Well, I'm glad that you could help me remember all the special things that we have to decorate our sanctuary for, and I hope that you'll remember them during this Advent season as we move towards Christmas. Let us pray, and please repeat after me. Holy God, we thank you for this special Advent season and for the gift of your Son. Help us to remember and to prepare and to celebrate his coming. In your name we pray. Amen. You can go, go back to your parents or to children's church.
Please join me for the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 to 10, entitled, The Peaceful Kingdom. Hear now the word of the Lord. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the word of the Lord. Our New Testament text comes from the book of Romans, chapter 15, verses 5 through 13. Hear now God's word to us. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ has become a, a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, Therefore, I will confess you among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall come, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. In him, the Gentiles shall hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Is it? Advent already? Is Christmas really less than three weeks away? How can that be? I'm not ready. Maybe you're not ready either. But ready or not, it's coming. There never seems to be enough time to do all the things that we want to do. We have this vision of what Christmas should be like, and we exhaust ourselves trying to make that vision, a reality. So much goes into our hopes and expectations that the holiday itself can sometimes be a letdown. In fact, we often hear the expression, the holiday blues, as people's moods swing up and down with unrealistic expectations, family conflicts, financial worries, exhausted children, and exasperated parents. Too many of us can't wait till it's all over with and we can drag the tree to the gutter, throw away the tinsel, 
and exchange those unwanted gifts. Now, bah humbug. Do I sound like a Scrooge or what? But I have to be honest. I have had some of those Scroogey thoughts on occasion when Advent just seemed to whiz right by me and I got all caught up in the commercial frenzy with all of its trappings. And there are trappings, aren't there? Stores decorated for Christmas before Halloween, carols on the radio in mid-November, pages and pages of slick advertisements in the newspaper, and commercials that depict love as finding the perfect gift. Now, I want to tell you from the voice of experience that the Easy Bake Oven makes terrible food, that Go-Go, the walking pup, was played with for maybe 15 minutes on Christmas morning, and that expensive set of weights that Tyler had to have about four years ago still clutters my sunroom. And do you know what else? The average weight gain during the holiday season is eight pounds. Somehow I think that is not the vision that Isaiah foretold or that John the Baptist implied when he said, prepare the way of the Lord, or that Paul described in his letter to the Romans. Our lectionary texts don't have anything to say about decorating or baking or shopping, but they do give us a vision of a better world, a world filled with hope and peace and joy. Isaiah prophesied a day when a righteous king would reign, establishing justice and peace for all the world. It would be a time of radical changes and illogical contradictions. A wolf will lie down with a lamb, the leopard shall lie with the kid, and a little child shall lead them. And as impossible as all that seems, we know that God does do the impossible. God works in our world through human beings and institutions, through mission and service, even through science and technology. God works with us and through us and sometimes in spite of us. Look what penicillin has done in the treatment of infection how open heart surgery has lengthened life expectancy, and the progress that has been made in the treatment of cancer. We've seen a man walk on the moon and explore the depths of the ocean. We've lived to see the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union. In the vision Isaiah describes, we see divine intervention and earth-shattering events. Isaiah, often referred to as the Advent prophet, proclaims the glory of God and the coming of a Messiah. The word Advent itself means coming. Prophecy becomes reality. The old is linked with the new, and God's promise is fulfilled. In this special season in the liturgical year, we prepare for Christ's coming, past present, and future. We celebrate Christ as a babe in Bethlehem, his coming into our lives as Lord and Savior, and he's coming to reign triumphantly in glory. We celebrate a season of hope, a vision for tomorrow, and the presence of God in our midst. Will Willimon, in a sermon on the Isaiah passage, says, Advent challenges our notions of what can and cannot be. Advent attempts to speak of a reality beyond our present realities, that time when God gets God's way with the world. Advent, then, is a visionary season, a time of expectancy and hope. I once read that hope is what distinguishes Christianity from other religions, it's what keeps us going when the going gets tough. Without it, life would sometimes be unbearable. Hope gives wind to the vision, empowers our faith, and propels us into action. 
we claim the vision and we become a part of it. Life enlarges beyond our television screen because we become a part of God's omnipotent and transcendent plan. God's work becomes our work and God's plan our plan. Joan Chittister in her commentary says, we must go on and go on and go on in our attempts to make the world new, to make the vision new, and to make ourselves new. A shoot will sprout from the stump of Jesse, Isaiah shouts. When it comes hopeless, when all of life seems hopeless, new life will come. When it seems that things cannot get any worse than they are, when everything that we've ever counted on, when everything that our society ever told us mattered fails, when money and success and connections and achievement have proved to be nothing but emptiness, lies, and idle hope, then we can do what must be done. We turn our lives over to Jesus Christ and hope will come. Something will come out of nothing. What has died in us will bring new life. Our text says, a little child shall lead them. And we remember that first Christmas, the story of the Christ child and visions of a baby in a manger. It is the most beautiful story ever told, and we never grow tired of hearing it. It has been set to music, created in art, memorialized in marble and bronze. In every language, in every nation, the story is told and retold. But my favorite telling of it is our first Presbyterian Church Christmas pageant, which will be here tonight in this sanctuary at 5 o'clock. Our traditional pageant, put in its current form by Mary Lou Presley, is one of our best-loved Advent customs. Its beauty is its simplicity, the narrated text and the familiar carols. No rehearsal is required, and everybody can be in it. Who could improve on it? It's perfect already. We have all the traditional characters, Mary and Joseph, kings and shepherds, angels and animals. We even have added a few animals to the menagerie. We have a spotted leopard, colored rabbits, a black cat, a brown squirrel, a gray horse, a baby beaver, a brown dog, and a rust deer. Our children love it. And our youth can't wait to be seniors and claim the most coveted roles. Now, it doesn't always go on without a hitch. We've had reluctant shepherds, wise men in combat boots, and many wobbly halos. We've even had a few kids bolt and run. <laughs> but no matter what happens, it never ceases to move me, to cause a catch in my throat and a tear in my eye. I remember my own kids at that age and many of yours as well. I remember the excitement and the expectation. I remember the sparkle in a child's eye and the hope expressed in word and song. Each year at Advent, we create a memory. It's a glimpse of the Christmas vision which unfolds each Sunday in Advent as we move closer to Bethlehem. It reminds us that the Christmas story despite its miraculous nature, is really a very simple story. It's the story of a man and a woman who are open to God's coming and allow God to use them as a part of God's divine plan. It's the story of the miracle of birth and the gift of life that we experience in part whenever we hold a new baby in our arms or baptized one here in this congregation. That new life is evidence that God hasn't given up on us, that there is still hope in the world. Despite war and famine, violence and bloodshed, illness, pain, or loss, we live in a world where there is hope. 
as a prophet's voice was a cry for repentance and faithfulness, a voice crying in the wilderness, we too are called to Advent. We are called to open our hearts, to clear away the clutter, to make room for the Holy One. We are called to realize what really matters. We are not to prepare for Christ's coming by rushing from store to store or extravagant spending that could put food on the tables of the world's hungry children. Our task is to bring new life around us by preparing our own worlds for the coming of Christ. How do we do that? How do we sift through all the stuff and hold on to what is important and meaningful for us? How do we unplug that elaborate Christmas machine and find some quality Advent time to recapture the hope and the wonder of it all? There is no easy answer. Believe me, if there was, it would be marketed and sold in the finest stores, thus defeating its very purpose. But I do believe that our texts today send us in the right direction. We begin with the vision. Imagine our lives and our celebrations the way we truly want them to be. We recall what is really important and prioritize our time, energy, and our use of God's resources. We ask ourselves, what is the true meaning of the season? And how can we find it again or for the very first time? in the message of the scriptures, in the beauty of the music, in the gifts of love and deeds of service, in the stories and traditions that we hold dear, we find its true meaning. We claim the promise of the prophets and the hope that is ours through Jesus Christ, despite situation or circumstance. We cherish that vision of hope and peace and we believe that it is possible. And we believe that we are called to invest ourselves in making it happen. We have a responsibility, a sacred obligation as followers of the Prince of Peace to move beyond self-centeredness, self-indulgence, and our prejudiced worldview. We must claim the vision of a new world to come a world where all people can live in harmony with one another. A world where there is freedom and justice and peace. And as we strive to find that in our own lives, we must protect, preserve it, and carry it forth for others. This Advent season, catch the vision, the vision of peace, a peace that passeth all understanding a peace that is the hope and promise of our lives and the world to come. Would you please stand as we respond to the word read and proclaimed by using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. I have a couple of pastoral concerns to share with you this morning, and then uh, quite a few announcements and things on our holiday calendars coming up. First, in the pastoral concerns, there was a death in the church family this week. Uh, Jackie Ennis died on Tuesday. Some of her family's here with us this morning. She was a member of the Koinonia class, served this church uh, well and faithfully for many, many years. She was the sister of Jim Mizell. And again, the services were held here Friday for Jackie Ennis. 
Frances Morrison is still in Western Wake this morning, getting her heart checked out. Bob Morrison uh, was at, uh, Raleigh, at Duke Health Raleigh Hospital all week, but he did not miss his turn teaching the Seekers this morning. He was here. No excuses. Uh, David Baxter had a new, uh, brand new uh, pacemaker and defibrillator put in, uh, and he's doing well. Same, similar thing that Mickey Brock had. I hope that David doesn't sprout all the facial hairs that uh, Mickey had. As Sheila said this evening, the legendary First Presbyterian Christmas pageant. I got a leaked copy of the bulletin. Uh, you may recognize uh, Mary and Joseph. You may even recognize the narrator. Anyway, it's the story we never tire. Five o'clock tonight. See if they bring a tear to Sheila's eye tonight. The Wednesday noon service, Dr. Ed McLeod will be the speaker this Wednesday. And a reminder that the Wednesday right before Christmas, uh, the speaker will be Dr. Al Edwards, who will be the first time in over a year. He's spoken at the Wednesday service. Jan Anderson will sing, and that's December 22nd, that Wednesday. A reminder for those who've paid up already, the Adult Fellowship Christmas Lunch is this Thursday, again, in a very uptown place, the Cardinal Club, right across the street. Meet here at the church, and everybody will go over together by 11 o'clock. A special holiday invitation from the official college of First Presbyterian Church, Peace College. Uh, their Christmas concerts are this Monday and Wednesday evenings in Keenan Recital Halls at 7 o'clock, no charge. Our Julia Thomas sings in the choir, and uh, one of the featured pieces will be uh, Christmas in the Southwest, 10 Spanish songs accompanied by harp, guitar, and marimba. They also have an 18-piece orchestra and quite a presentation. Again, Monday and Wednesday this evening, uh, those evenings at Peace College at 7 o'clock. Next Sunday is the third Sunday in Advent, and that's when our music program will make their annual uh, offering of Christmas music and featuring a choir and organ and uh, instrumentalists. And in that regard, the chapel choir, David reminds you, is rehearsing this afternoon at 3.30, as it says in the uh, church calendar. Mary Jo Littlewood wanted me to tell you there are two more picture days. Uh, all these folks that are about to join the church still have a chance to get in the uh, church directory December 14th and 15th. Well, that comes up to a Wednesday and a Thursday. So call Mary Jo Littlewood at home. We may still hit our goal of 100% of people in the bulletin or in the, in the uh, pictorial directory so that Ed will have a chance of learning all our names and faces. And by the way, the McClouds are going are to invite all our faces over to their house for an open house, which Ed will tell you about in just a minute. But you want to get that on your calendar for uh, uh, Saturday, December the 18th. This time, I want to put you to the test. We've got a whole bunch of new faces to learn, and I invite all the folks that the session received this morning, if you would come forward, and we will introduce you to some, uh, some of our newest members received by the session. Sinclair is bringing his family up here first, so we'll start with the uh, Michaud's, Macon and Martha, who've been uh, attending the, uh, the Ed Greer class. Uh, Macon works for uh, Documents Direct, and Martha, they're actually they're coming to us from an Episcopal church, but Martha grew up in the Presbyterian church in Durham. Their three children, her daughter Hunley, and son Makey, and youngest son Dave. Uh, Dave is in the pre-kindergarten at St. Michael's, and you're in Lacey Elementary, and you two are in Lacey Elementary. Glad to have them joining by letter of transfer. Let's see, and then we have the uh, Sinclairs here, uh, Sebastians rather, with, uh, with uh, Britton Hopkins as their elder. And uh, did I mention Louis Sinclair as the elder? Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's see. We got Britton Hopkins with his group, uh, Neil and Linda Sebastian, coming to us by letter of transfer from White Memorial. Uh, Neil works with Collins Transportation, Linda for the Wake Public Schools. This is their son, Patrick, who's a junior at Broughton High School, very fine high school. Uh, they have two other daughters, including uh, Katie, who's in uh, her uh, junior year at East Carolina, but she spent her first two years at Peace College, and uh, Mary has finished college. So we welcome the Sebastians. And let's see, now we've got uh, uh, Susan Freeman and her granddaughter, believe it or not, Cameron. Cameron's in the fifth grade at Van Dora Springs, but she'll be in middle school next year. She's been in Mrs. Dorman's fifth grade class and loves it. Uh, Susan works for uh, Stone Truck Parts. She's coming to us by letter of transfer from Rockbridge Presbyterian Church in Clinton, South Carolina. Glad to have you with us. Catherine Hardy, also a grandmother, is there at Elder. And let's see, now we've got uh, the Littles, Don and Sylvie Little. Sorry y'all had to fight for a seat. This must be a really good church if you got to fight for a seat to get in. Too bad I forgot to reserve seats for y'all. 
They, uh, Don is uh, joining by reaffirmation of faith. He uh, teaches at Wake Tech, and his sons are Stefan and Eric. And Sylvia, Sylvia gets the award for coming to us from uh, long distance. She's originally from France. Joyeux Noël, or something like that. I can also say Beaujolais Nouveau, but that's a different occasion. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Gray is there. Uh, glad to have the, uh, the little ones with us. And let's see now. Matt and Tori Stewart in the back with, uh, with Nat Sparrow as their elder. Uh, they're the newlyweds. Just born on September, or married on September the 18th. So, uh, the, the marriage was born on the 18th. So we're glad to have them. Matt works as a, a loan officer for Wells Fargo. Tori's a loan officer at Beneficial Finance. Matt's coming to us from First Presbyterian Church, Virginia Beach. And Tori is an Iowa native. She's coming by letter of transfer from a North American Baptist Church in Buffalo, New York. Glad to have the newlyweds, Matt and Tori Stewart, with us, and Nat Sparrow, their elder. And I would ask you all to reaffirm, as you did for the session this morning, uh, who is your Lord and Savior? And will you attempt, with God's help, to be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Yes. yes. We're delighted to have you all with us, and if you will gather up front after the service, folks would like to greet you personally. So thank you very much for coming, and we'll see you after. If they look like very good people, they look exactly like the people that come to see Carolyn Moore during the week. <laughs> Bull and why? That's what we need to know about them. I know you won't believe it, but I also said at the first service, Bob's hard act to follow. <laughs> good morning. As I have for the past several years, I'm here to speak to you regarding the Friendship Fund supported by, this, by our church. Although most of you are familiar with the Friendship Fund, I would like to take a moment to explain this ministry to our new members and our visitors. Carol O'Brien is our Director of Outreach Ministries. Her salary and some of the expenses of our outreach program are part of the church's budget. All donations to the Friendship Fund are outside of our church's budget and go directly to help clients. We only help people once a year and they, mu they must be working at least 30 hours per week be a full-time student or be disabled. As established by the Outreach Committee, our mission is to help the working poor who have experienced an unexpected crisis. We currently see 15 to 20 clients per week and primarily help with rent, electricity, and gas bills. As I often said, when you pass one of our clients on the street or in a store, you cannot tell the difference between them and me. This was especially brought home to me this past week. I interviewed a single mother who was my age. She has three children and one grandchild in her home. She has never asked for help and has a good paying job with a health organization. She was in a car accident in October and was out of work for three weeks. She had no short term disability and used all her leave time during the first week. The insurance company will not settle until all her expenses are incurred. This will be several months as she will have to undergo physical therapy since she had no, uh, no income, her doctor reluctantly allowed her to return to work on a limited basis. Although her ex-husband is paying child support, she has not received the payments from the state. We were able to help her with her past due rent. Our clients usually live one paycheck away from hunger or homelessness. Most have at least one dependent. Bad weather, sickness, car repairs, or accidents, or a downturn in the economy can take their rent food, and heat money. I would like to invite each of you to take advantage of this wonderful and rewarding volunteer opportunity. As we celebrate our Savior's birth, please consider a gift to the Friendship Fund in honor of a Sunday school teacher, a circle leader, friend or relative, or in memory of a loved one. You simply fill out this form and return it to the church office with your check. A Christmas card will be sent to the individual you are honoring or the family of the one you are remembering. Every day, we pass people without realizing how close they are to the edge. But friends, I'm here to tell you that we have many struggling people in our own community. Through God's grace, most of us have been abundantly blessed. With this blessing comes a responsibility. As Paul reminds the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 8, 7, just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. 
I challenge each of you to claim the vision as Sheila described this morning and share some of what God has given you and experience the true joy of Christmas. Thank you. Thank you, Carol Ann. Before we pray, Bob made a reference to uh, an invitation from the McLeods. Uh, he wasn't making that up. The, the, um, in the first press this week, there on the front page, there will, this coming week, there will be an invitation to the church family of First Presbyterian Church to come to the McLeod house for a drop-in from 4 to 7 on the 18th of December. That's a, that's a Saturday. Um, we, and I'm really here to tell you that we really are serious. We do really, um, it's not, we're, it, it'll be in the first press, it'll be mentioned in the newsletter, but we're running out of time to extend this invitation. We'll put invitations in Sunday school classrooms. The only thing we ask is for you not all to come at one time. Uh, that's why it's a drop-in. It's four to seven. Come, get a bite to eat, visit with us and those other members of the church family who are there. Uh, in, the, in the invitation that will be in the Sunday school classes, there will be a direct, directions to our house. It's pretty easy to find. Uh, parking is sometimes at a premium, but we do live just down the street from the biggest parking lot from White Memorial Presbyterian Church. And I've told Art Ross that periodically we may need to use his parking lot. And I, I, have, I don't have a signed affidavit, but he said, just help yourself. Well, this is going to be one of those times we're helping ourselves. And so uh, uh, come on the 18th. The details will be in the, uh, in the first press, but it's a, a casual event. Uh, ch it's a child-friendly event. So we co come and be with us. We look forward to opening our doors to you. And now, as God's people gather together, let us join together in prayer. Eternal God, perfect in love, perfect in power, we bow before you this day in thanksgiving and praise. Grateful for your mercy, trusting in your promise always to abide with us. To our great delight, you have chosen to bridge the distance between us, and you have come to where we are. You could have chosen to be a far away and distant God, leaving us to wonder what you think of us, but instead you drew near to us and proclaimed a gospel we had not even dared to imagine. For that gospel, O oh God, and for every expression of your providence and care, we come before you in grateful praise. And we bring our cares and concerns before you, O oh God, for loved ones who are broken and anxious and afraid, for friends and those known to us, even ourselves, as we face illness and grief and loneliness. Trusting that you are at work in the world for good, trusting that you have the capacity to overcome evil and bring healing and life and joy, we place ourselves and our concerns before you. The truth about ourselves is we are no match for the adversaries that we face in this world, but our adversaries are no match for you. Give us such faith that we can live our lives in quiet confidence as we trust in you in all things and in that trust find peace. Eternal God, once again the Prince of Peace comes into a world fractured by warfare and violence, which means once again he will be out of place when he arrives. Two thousand years and so little change. Begin this year, O God, by changing us. Give us hearts open to the Christ child, open to his way, his truth, and his life. For we have had enough of the world as it is. And so in Jesus Christ we seek your kingdom. Lord God of grace, Jesus Christ was born in poverty and obscurity at the far edge of human society. And he lived his life drawn to those who were born the same way. It is impossible to follow Jesus and ignore the poor and the outcast. We know we've been, because we've tried. But Jesus manages to remind us that the poor are our concern, that a hungry child is to summon us to action. In reaching out to lepers, Jesus showed us there are no limits to his love. And so give us such boundless compassion. Give us boundless compassion that the world might see Jesus at work in us. Give us hearts to notice all those who suffer that their suffering might not be compounded by our inclination to look away. 
Instead, O oh God, help us to look at the world the way you do as we seek to reflect your image and point the way to Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We hope you have felt warm and welcome here as you've gathered here with the congregation of First Presbyterian Church. And whether you're a member of the church or visiting with us, we hope you'll sign the friendship sheets as they are passed among you so we can have a record of you being here so you can know who it is sitting alongside you this day. If you're visiting here and would like to make this your church home, and you can put that down on the, on the sheets as they go by, or you can speak to one of us following the service today. But again, we're grateful for your presence, and together now let us continue our worship as we bring God's tithes and our offerings. <clears throat>
us pray. Lord God of grace, we are humbled as we think of your gift to us, your gift of life and hope and joy, and your gift to us of Jesus the Christ. We stand before you now with our gifts to you. Use them, O God. Take them into your hands and multiply them and then use them to be a blessing to the world that we might share in your holy work now and always through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. the God of hope be with you this Advent season as we embrace the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go in peace.